Good evening, Rock Church. Praise the Lord to all of you. It is great again to greet you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as we join together again on this Sunday evening for a time of fellowship with God and His Word. Even though we're not in the same room tonight, we can fellowship together through the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This is the beauty of being a child of God, having this privilege, having the opportunity to connect with people around the world and not even know who they are or where they are. But we are at the throne together. Every time we go to God in prayer, we're rubbing shoulders with people from everywhere. What a privilege this is. What a revelation. What a revelation knowledge that we need to involve ourselves in constantly. Amen. So tonight, we look forward to sharing with you a few words of faith uh, I'll be recapping from this morning, our morning service, and then moving into, um, actually, it will be part two of the ministry from this morning. Amen. I trust that that you all enjoyed your day, enjoyed the presence of the Lord any time that you were able to give to God throughout the afternoon of prayer, studying, reading his word, whatever this was. Even if it was fellowshipping the people of God, breaking bread together. The body of Christ is a living, breathing entity. Those of us who are connected to it through the power of the Holy Ghost are connected to a, a huge body. A, a body that is connected with all the joints and the bands that bring it together and then what flows through the body in all of its connective parts. So this is who we are. This is what we are. Amen. So let's um, put, focus your mind on God and his word tonight as we go to the Lord in prayer, just to remind you very quickly that um, it is the holiday season. It is upon us now. Thanksgiving is just around the corner and then Christmas. So just remember that the week of Thanksgiving the week of Thanksgiving, there will no, there will not be a midweek service. Um, so just keep your mind on that and remember um, in getting together with all of your family and friends that we not lose sight of what's truly important this season. Um, this is something that um, we do every year with Thanksgiving and Christmas and but it's very easy to get busy and forget. So let's not do that. Let's focus. Let's make these, these family get-togethers an opportunity to connect, not just family-wise, but with the family of God. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. We need to remember some special needs tonight as we pray. Bishop and Sister Smith are traveling. Um, he was... Um, Last night was very sick. He is feeling better. We thank God for that. And um, it's, it's one thing to be sick when you're at home and something quite different to be um, 1,500 miles away and not be feeling well. And so we're thankful to the Lord that he is better today. We thank God for that. Amen. We need to pray for Sister Shirley. She was not well this morning either. Um, no voice, um, very sick in her body. We need to continue praying for Brother Juan, Sister Julie. In that situation, continue to pray um, across the body of Christ, not just here, but everywhere. There are people suffering with physical, mental, emotional things. Um, it's the holidays, memories of family members that have gone on to be with the Lord. And so I know that this is a time where we remember things that we would not normally think about. We remember those meetings, those get-togethers, those gatherings around the dinner table or around the Christmas tree or whatever the case would be. But let's remember those in our families and loved ones, friends, that, that will be remembering their, their missed loved one this year. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer and then get into the word of the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, we're grateful for the power and the privilege that we have to pray. 
It's something, oh Lord, that we probably take for granted more times than we should. But tonight, in Jesus' name, we take advantage of this moment. We take advantage of the opportunity to open our mouths and release the sound of faith. God, to speak those things tonight that be not as though they were. To speak things in, in faith, believing that you are going to do them. To speak healing and deliverance and guidance and clarity. To speak peace, Lord, into tumultuous situations in people's lives right now. To speak to the wind and the waves. To rebuke the evil and command it to be still. In the name of the Lord Jesus, exactly what you did in, on that sea of Galilee, O oh Lord. You rebuked the wind. In the name of Jesus, and so, Lord, we, we say to those things, those winds of adversity that blow, God, we know that there are times when it's your will for these things to happen, and then there are the other times, Lord, when, when spiritual attacks come. And so, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that whatever is not supposed to be there, Lord, we bind it, we cast it down to the pit from whence it has come. And those things, O oh Lord, that you have loosed and released into the lives of your people, that, that we might learn things, that we can be taught, O oh Lord, about faith and trust in you. So tonight, in Jesus' name, we pray in all of these categories. We don't know every situation. We don't even know exactly how to pray in all of them. But we speak peace and healing and clarity and wisdom and direction. And we speak, we, we, we speak deliverance from sickness and disease. We speak healing into the bodies of those that are afflicted tonight, the comfort and the care of the Holy Ghost for those who are grieving tonight. So, Lord, not our will in any of these things, but your will be done. But we don't want to just not pray because we don't know exactly what to say. But, oh, Lord, tonight that we may pray even without complete knowledge of the situation. We can pray even without complete knowledge of what you're trying to do in a particular situation. We have your word. We know what it says we can pray about and for. And those things, O oh Lord, that we're not certain of, we still pray and we say, nevertheless, not our will, but thine be done. And God, God again, it's not a cop out. It's not a cop out to say these things, to speak faith and healing and deliverance. But again, not our will, but thine be done. That's a true statement. It's very true. You exampled it for us yourself, Jesus. In the Garden of Eden, when you or the Garden of Gethsemane, when you prayed for that cup to pass, you knew that you had to drink it, but you prayed anyway. But you you ended that prayer with not my will, but thine be done. And so, O oh Lord, you accepted the Father's will, and this is what we pray as well. Not our will in any of these, but your will be done. But we do know with certainty that we can pray for the lost. We know with certainty, Lord, we can speak those things right now that we need to say over our lost loved ones, that the things they desire to do with their lives, we can pray that those things will no longer satisfy, that those things will no longer give them what they're looking for. We can pray these things with certainty, Father. We can pray, Lord, that you will take their sleep from them. We can pray, O oh Lord, that you can make their lives utterly and completely miserable so that they will turn to you. These are the things we know we can pray. And God, those people that are in the world that don't know you, those people who have never experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the sickness and the disease that's in their life, we can speak to those because those are the people you primarily did your miracles to and for. And so tonight, in Jesus' name, those people who we believe need the Holy Ghost, those people we know who need your Spirit, we speak into their lives right now that faith and healing and miracles and signs and wonders will be demonstrated to open their eyes to your power, to your dominion and your authority. And we pray tonight your will be done as we study your word. Speak, Lord, direct us by this word we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you would take your Bible and let's go to the book of Second Peter. For those of you who were with us on Thursday night, this will be somewhat of a repeat, but the Holy Ghost brought me back again this afternoon as a part two to Sunday morning's message. This morning we preached on the, the glory of righteousness 
And the word glory, which we have studied before, the word glory, it refers to God in acts of manifestation. God's power to work in whatever situation and however he wants to work. The word glory from Vines, expository dictionary of the Bible or the New Testament says that it is the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation. That's the word glory. So whenever you see this word used, um, at least from my study, the word, the Greek word, the English transliteration of the Greek word is doxa, D-O-X-A. That word is glory. Again, it's the nature and the acts of God in self-manifestation, what he essentially is and does as exhibited in whatever way he reveals himself. And that is in respect to who he is and what he is. And this, is, and this was done particularly in the ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. So this is the glory of righteousness. And then this word righteousness is that imputed gift from God that declares us to be right with God. It's right wiseness. It's not something that I earn. It's not something that I um, can take for myself. It's what's given to me and you whenever we obey the gospel. When we receive the gospel, we obey the scriptures and we are born again of water and spirit. The Bible says that righteousness is imputed to us. It's not something that I gain for myself. It is a gift from God that only he can impart, that we can be righteous as he is righteous. So he puts that within us. He imputes that to us the same way that he imputed righteousness to Abraham. When Abraham believed the word of the Lord and then he obeyed what God said for him to do. And the Bible says because of that, it was imputed to him for righteousness. So let's begin with, I know I told you to go to 2 Peter, but if you're using a, a real Bible, just put your finger in 2 Peter chapter 1. And let's flip over to Romans chapter four very quickly, just for the sake of clarification, just for the sake of understanding. Not going to be in a hurry tonight, not planning on being very long at all, but I do want to share this part two of the glory of righteousness. And this morning we talked about the fact that when God imputes righteousness to us, he gives it to us based on who he is and what he is and based on what he has said to us in his word. The Bible is God's word. And so whatever he has put into this, this book, these 66 books that we call the Bible, whatever he has put in, in there for us to practice, to us, for us to apply to our lives, it was intended that we would do that. It was not just suggestions. The Bible speaks many times of commands that God gives. There are, there are um, statements that are in the imperative tense, which means it is a command that is being given. And when a command is given, there is the expectation that someone will be obedient to the command and fulfill that word. And so this is what the Bible has for us. God through his word, has given us commandments about who he is and what he is. He has given a, he's given us commandments about our, of, of our responsibility to myself and to others around me and ultimately my responsibilities towards the kingdom of God. But my participation in God and his kingdom revolves around the fact that he has made us righteous. He made you, if you're born again of water and spirit, he has made you righteous. And it is that righteousness of God that is working inside of us that produces the character that we need as we participate in the kingdom. He didn't leave us the way we came to him. He called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. He didn't leave us in the state of darkness that we were in. He called us from darkness and gave us the light of this great truth, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He gave us this knowledge. And then we had a choice to answer the call of the gospel, 
to repent of our sins, to be water baptized in Jesus' name, to be filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And in that act of faith, he imputes righteousness to us. And then this work of righteousness, this is what we're preaching. The glory of righteousness is the manifestation of God through that righteousness to produce character in us that looks just like the Lord Jesus. I know that's a mouthful. I said a lot. That was a very long sentence. But the truth of the matter is his righteousness at work inside of the believer produces his character. And that's the character that I need to participate with God in his kingdom. Amen. So let's look again at how righteousness comes to us. Romans chapter four. Um, and let's begin reading in one second. Say again. Romans chapter four. And let's begin reading at verse 14. And we'll, and we'll read down to the end of the chapter. I know it's a lot of reading, but that's 14 to 25. Um, I'll try to read it and not say a whole lot about it, but just simply want to lay a groundwork of righteousness and how it comes to us. Verse 14, Romans 4 and 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth, the, calleth those things that be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Now, a very important point to keep in mind is that Abraham is the father of many nations. This is something to keep in mind as we're talking about righteousness, because as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, that faith would not be. This is what the, the scriptures are saying from 14 until till 18, is that it's not just the Jewish nation that Abraham is representing. Abraham is also representing every other nation of the world. Because what did God say? Go back to Genesis 15 and read again the promise that God made to Abraham. He said that every family on the earth would be blessed and that every nation would be blessed. And, um, and then in a, I believe it was maybe chapter 20, Genesis 20, somewhere in there, he's, he uses the phrase that the families of the earth would be blessed, every family. So when you consider this fact that every person that would believe in God through faith the faith of Abraham would be passed on to every generation. And then eventually every single family on the earth would tie back to Abraham in some way or another. And the faith in God that Abraham had would be transferred all the way to the end of time. So the very important. As Abraham's faith in God was, ours must be the same way. We must take God at his word. We must believe the scriptures and then or we must believe what the scriptures say and then obey it, putting it into practice. This is how we exercise faith by simply obeying what the word of God is saying. All right, verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. The point here that the writer is making, if, you, you, if you're not familiar with the story, we don't have time to go back and review it right now. But Abraham and Sarah had no children. So God promised Abraham probably 25 years before, before um, Isaac was ever born. That, they, that he and Sarah would have a son. And at the point, at the moment when God made the promise, they were probably still, still within the age of childbearing, very possibly. 
But God waited until Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 for God to give them a child. When they were past the age of childbearing, when it was impossible for them to do what needed to be done in order to have a child, Sarah's womb was dead. It was dried up. She was not having any more children. So God waited until it was completely impossible. And so this is the point that is being made in the scriptures. He didn't consider the fact that he was 100. He didn't even think about the fact that she was 90 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He's, verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he, God, was able also to perform. Again, this, this goes back to Abraham remembering what God had said. So, so keep in mind, Abraham did not have a Bible. We have a Bible. So when God spoke to Abraham, that was the word of God that was being spoken. Now we have these 66 books compiled together that make up the whole canon of the scriptures that God intended for us to have. And so what God was saying to Abraham was the word of God. So when God has made promises to Abraham, those promises were transferred to, to you and me, those of us who would believe the gospel and then obey the scriptures. And therefore, by Abraham's faith, then our faith in that same word would, would lead us to righteousness. He, Abraham, staggered not at the promise of God that he would have a son. And so he did what, was, what he was commanded to do by God, and therefore a child was born. Let's finish this. Verse 23. I'm sorry, 21 again. And being fully persuaded, Abraham, being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore... It was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, let's just, just take a second here. Again, I'm not in a hurry to, to get a long way into this tonight, but you and I need to, need to fully grasp and understand the power of what imputed righteousness is. Imputed righteousness cannot be earned. It cannot be bought. It cannot be sold. It is something that, that God gives because he has, he has the right and the power and the authority to give it. He alone can say who is righteous and who is not because he alone is righteous. So when God made his promise to Abraham, I, I don't remember exactly in those words that God made to Abraham that he was going to um, tell him or make him righteous. It's just that God found a man that he could trust, called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, just like he did to us when he called us out of, doc out of darkness. He called us out of false doctrine and brought us into the glorious light of this truth about Jesus Christ. And he called us by his grace, laid out the plan of salvation for us through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> then we had a choice to obey it or to reject it. And at the point that we believed and then obeyed the scriptures, righteousness was imputed. This is the same with Abraham. So let's look for just a second. Um, verse 22. The word to the word impute, obviously it is a verb. It's it's God taking action. It means to reckon, to count, to compute. It means to take into account. So when God took into account Abraham's faithfulness, he was faithful to God and his word to him. And when God took that into account, he looked at Abraham and it was as if he took a stamp and of God's approval on Abraham and he stamped it and said, I've taken into account your life and your faith in me. Therefore, you are righteous. 
It's the same act of faith that you and I give ourselves to in regards to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham's dispensation and our dispensation completely different, but yet the act in both dispensations is the same. It is taking God at his word when he speaks to us, believing that his word is true, and then acting upon that word in faith. It's it's what he said in um, verse 17, as it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the, de who quickeneth the dead. And you ready? And calleth those things which be not as though they were. God said to Abraham before it was possible before he even had a child and when it was impossible for him to have a child, he called those things which were not. He said, you're going to have a child. That's what God does. He speaks to those things which are not as though they were already in existence. And so when he called us out of darkness, he called us with the intent that we would be saved. That that was not, he called by the gospel so that what he had already spoken would happen would indeed come to pass in your life and mine. So the word compute or the word to impute means to take into account, to reckon. It would be the same way when you, when you balance your checkbook. Um, if this word deals with reality, if I reckon that my checkbook has $25 in it, then it has $25 because you've gone to it and you've, you've balanced it. You took it into account. You reckoned it out to the very end and you have a balance at the end. This word, it refers to facts, not opinions and, and not supposition. This is something that God looks at us through his own eyes and through his laws, his word of God. And he says to us, I see you as obedient to my word. Therefore, I'm putting my stamp of approval on you. You are righteous. Righteousness is an amazing gift. It's something that you don't even have to. Um, well, I've said it already. You, you can't earn it. And really and truly, the only thing that we do in order to have this righteousness of God is simple obedience to God and his word. Abraham obeyed God and righteousness was reckoned to him by God, making him righteous. Verse 23. Romans 4, 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. Are you ready? If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. This, this is what it means for you and I to be righteous is if we believe on him that raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, I'm not gonna I'm not going to tell you that this, this believing is just simple mental assent that we say to the Lord, Well, I, I believe in God. That that is the furthest thing from the truth. To simply speak with your lips and say, Well, I believe I believe in God, or I, I believe in the Lord Jesus. Yes, I realize there is a scripture that says it. It's in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you will confess with the Lord Jesus with your mouth, you shall be saved. And that is absolutely the truth. But you got to understand what Romans 10, 9 and 10 was, who that was written to, and that it was written to the brethren. It was written to the church. This is not written to the, the lost who need God. When he says that we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, it's talking here in, in Romans chapter 4, Verse 24, he's speaking of this fact that I, I hear what the gospel says and me believing it is boiled down to one simple word, obedience. You can't find in the scriptures that word that's translated as believe in verse 24. That word is never translated in English as faith. 
The root word for this word to believe in verse 24 comes from the word faith. So in order to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, one must have faith. And faith comes from being convinced that God's word is true. So if I believe God's word is true, then I accept the gospel message and then I believe or I then act on what I am saying I believe. It's obedience. <coughs> this is what Abraham did. He was obedient to God's word and therefore righteousness was imputed to him. Verse chapter five, verse one. When, uh, uh, never mind, don't, don't go there. Let's, let's, let's move on. So let's go now to 2 Peter chapter 1. So just to lay a little groundwork about where we went with this this morning. Took a little bit more time there than I intended to take with that. But the point being tonight that the, the truth of the matter is God called us by his grace. And in his call, he placed in it everything that I would need for life and godliness. He put everything into his call that I would need to live a life that pleases him in every aspect. But it boils down to me and you being obedient to this word. Okay, so now let's take this a step further. We're talking about the glory of righteousness or this work of righteousness within and what it produces. Now we talked this morning about what, about what it does. Righteousness, it produces justification. I'm now right with God. I have his righteousness or his right wiseness. Now I am justified. I've received justification just as if I have never sinned. That justification then leads to sanctification. Sanctification is the process of that righteousness that's working with inside of me, producing the character of God, which then leads me to holiness. Righteousness, justification, sanctification, which leads me ultimately to holiness. And we talked about it this morning. Holiness is not simply how I live and dress, where I go, the places I go the things I do, the places I go, the way I act. It's not simply, that's not holiness. Hair and dress is not holiness. Holiness is a outward show of what's going on within. But simply just to, just to look the part. Jesus told the Pharisees, you look good on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. So it's not the outward appearance that, that we're looking for. Don't misunderstand me. Don't read between the lines. Don't assume that I'm telling you that you can live and act and do as you please. But what I'm saying is that how I appear on the outside and the way I speak and the things I do, the places I go, all of these should be a reflection of who I am in here. We've talked about it in weeks past that Jesus um, was speaking to a group of Pharisees one day when they told him that he was casting out demons by the prince of demons, Beelzebub. Jesus told them, he says, how can you being evil speak good things? He says, it's impossible for you to speak good things because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Jesus was telling those Pharisees that their hearts were basically evil and what was coming out of their mouth was a reflection of what's in their heart. And so for you and I, this is, this is um, doubly important, if you please, that if we are going to call ourselves a Christian, then there needs, there needs to be a consistency of what people see and hear in us, that they see us the same day in and day out. Because if I am a child of God, I will constantly be growing in these things of God. I will constantly be, be producing more and more fruit in my life that reflects God's goodness and grace. If I'm not producing any fruit in my life, the fruit of righteousness, if no one can see that in my life, then there's a problem in here. It's not a problem with what, with what they're seeing. The problem goes deeper inside of me and I have not given the glory of righteousness, the freedom or the room to work inside of me so that it produces the character that ultimately shows up in who I am 
and what I am. That is true holiness. Holiness is not manifested in separation from the world alone. There's a lot of people in the world who, who, who separate themselves from certain activities that are not born again believers in Jesus Christ. So you cannot simply say that separation from the world is enough. Separation from the world is scriptural. It's taught through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. We are taught to be separate from the rest of the world. But again, separation in and of itself does not constitute holiness. The work of righteousness within produces the character of God inside first and foremost. And then, and then, and only then does it produce the qualities of of that believer on the outside. When I open my mouth, I speak truth and I speak righteousness and I reflect the love of God. This is the work of righteousness within. So what this is telling us tonight, that we must give space for this righteousness to work. How does that happen? Second Peter chapter one. Second Peter chapter one, let's begin at verse number one. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according. Now listen to the words that are used here. Verse two, again, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according to, according as his divine power hath given. Now this is an important word. God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. The New Living Translation says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and his excellence. So first and foremost, we see that God has given us everything that we need. All of the, all of the tools, all of the weapons, the armor, he has given me everything, given you and me everything that we will need to produce the character inside of us that pleases him first and foremost. Verse four, and he says, whereby, the things that were said in verse three, he says, whereby are given unto us, again, he uses the word given, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And because of this glory and excellence, of glory and excellence that is in God, he, that, that he has already given to us, he has also given us these great and precious promises. And these are the things that enable us to share with him in his divine nature. And by that divine nature at work in us, we are able to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now you think about this for a second. Without the spirit of God in us, we are at the mercy of the enemy, the, the spirit of the age that's at work in the world. Without the spirit of God working inside of us, we have no power against the spirit of the age. The Apostle Peter is telling us that everything that I need, that I can escape the corruption that is in the world, that is through human desires, God has given those things to us. And now I don't have to live simply by what I want. Now the Spirit's work inside of us, changing us, bringing us into 
this relationship with him to where I look just like Jesus. It's what he's telling us. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. Verse five. And beside this, you mean he's not finished here? No, I'm sorry. He's not finished. God has given us everything. He's provided everything that we need to live a godly life in this present world. And then Peter says in verse five, and besides that, you ready? Giving. Who's giving now? You and me. Now he says, I want you to give diligence. This is to make every effort to respond to these promises. Beside this, giving all diligence, that word diligence there is a, it's a strong word. It, it, the word, it, it means, just, just give me a second here. It means to make haste. It means to give earnestness, to be diligent in what you are doing, not just haphazardly going about your Christian life. But he says, it's no, it's, it's high time to give diligence, to make your relationship with Jesus Christ a priority. It's with anything. If you're going to run a marathon race, let's say you have a goal to run a marathon by, by this time next year. What are you going to do? Are you just going to lay around through November and December and January, February, March, and maybe maybe April or May, somewhere you might start jogging? If you're going to run a marathon 26 miles by this time next year, you're going to have to put in some intense training. You're going to have to give diligence to that goal and say, if I'm going to do this, then I've, I've got to start getting up at the crack of dawn and going and exercising and training and practicing and running and practicing and training and running and practicing and training and running, giving diligence to that so that you can indeed run a marathon in November of next year. The point is being made. Paul or Peter is telling us, okay, God has given you everything. Now, what are you going to do with it? He says, besides all of this, it's time for you and me to give all diligence. Now, I have to start adding, according to the scriptures, what I need for these things to grow and prosper in my relationship with Jesus Christ. You ready? Verse five. And beside this, giving all diligence, Add, add to your faith, that faith that has been given to us. Verse one, when he said that you have, that we who Peter's writing to have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our savior, Jesus Christ. So he says, what are you going to do with that faith that was given to you? You're going to add to that faith virtue. What is virtue? Virtue is moral excellence. And you're not going to have moral excellence or excellence that, exp that is expressed in deeds by just haphazardly going through the motions. You can't have moral excellence. You can't have the kind of virtue in our lives. We can't have virtue in our life the way we need to by just simply, eh, okay, big deal. It'll come on its own. No, it won't. Anything... That, that God is demanding of us is something that we have to give ourselves to. If you're going to have a life of prayer, then you have to carve out time and space for prayer. If you're going to study God's word, you're going to read, you're going to be a child of God in any shape or form, then time again has to be carved out of your schedule. You've got to make it happen. If you and I don't carve out the time and the space, even the place for it, it's not going to happen. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And now he is saying, okay, what are you going to do with what I have given you? He says, add to your faith this moral excellence. And then he says, add to moral excellence, knowledge. Knowledge of what? Knowledge of that which is true. And how do I find out what is true? By going to look at what is true, God's 
word. Now, I mentioned this Thursday night in our care group here at Urban Crest. If you want to know what is true, then you have to study what is true. That way, when the counterfeit is presented, you recognize it immediately. If you were to go to a bank or the credit union here in town and apply for a job to be a teller, someone who's going to be cashing checks and counting out money to give to people at your, at your counter, at your window. Before you're put behind that desk, you're trained about currency. You're trained what true United States Treasury currency looks like and feels like. You recognize all of the nuances of, of true currency. You're able to look at it in the light and see the, all of the safeguards as to, that have been put into true currency. The same thing with the scriptures. If I need to know what is true about God, then I need to go to his word, this very Bible, that which he has given to us. So the moment that false doctrine passes in front of my eyes, that I'm not being tossed with every wind of doctrine and suddenly blown this way and suddenly blown this way with every wind that comes. Why? I'll recognize it. I'll see it because I know what is true. So when a, when a counterfeit $100 bill is passed across your window, someone wants to deposit that or they're trying to, to buy something with a counterfeit bill, the person who is taking that currency into their hands, if they have been taught and trained what true currency looks like, they will say, this is not real and hand it back to the person and say, I'm not accepting this counterfeit bill. No matter how much the person protests and says it's real, someone who has, have not, who has knowledge of the true can recognize the counterfeit immediately. And if you and I think that we're going to escape being presented counterfeit doctrine and counterfeit truth in this last hour, if we think that we're not going to have that come to us, I'm going to say it very plainly. We're fools. Because the devil has sought from the very beginning of time, to counterfeit everything that God has ever said or done. The devil has tried to mimic it and come up with something that looks very close to it, even though it can never measure up to what is true. This is what he used with Eve in the Garden of Eden. He presented something that sounded like God's word. He even quoted a portion of what God had said to Eve. But he took it out of context. He misquoted it. And so when Eve heard it because she didn't truly know, have true knowledge of what God had said, she believed the lie. And a, even though Satan used a portion of truth, it was still a lie because he wrested the truth and made it sound the way he wanted it to sound. And he, he caused Eve to believe a lie. And therefore, she partook of the tree, gave it to her husband, who went along with it. And therefore, sin came into the world because of disobedience. And the Bible says that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing was wrong, and he did it anyway. But here's the point. What the scriptures are teaching us is that I have been given everything I need to live a life that's pleasing to God, but I have got some things I need to do to participate with that work of Christ inside of me. He's not going to do everything for me. As a believer, I, have, I still have a human will. I still have a human character. I still have human desires and, 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 hu and uh, a, a humanity that is vile before God. And so therefore, yes, he redeemed me, washed me in his own blood, took away all of the sin and the stain. But yet my own will can override the will of God at any moment. So the Lord says, OK, I'm going to do my part. You believe the gospel. You obeyed the scriptures and I gave you my robe of righteousness. Now, what are you going to do with it? I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. I've given you exceeding great and precious promises. That you might be a partaker of my divine nature so that you can escape the corruption that's in the world. Okay, I've given you those things. 
Now verse five says, you and I have got to add these things in our life. And these are the things I do when I pray. These are the things I do when I fellowship God through his word. These are the things I do when I go to my care group on Wednesday or Thursday or Sunday night. These are the things I do when I fellowship the people of God. These are the things I do when I listen to, to holy, godly preaching of the word of God. I have to give myself to every single one of these categories. He says, add to your faith, virtue, moral excellence. Add to your virtue, knowledge. Knowledge of that which is true. Then he says to knowledge, you need to add temperance. And temperance is simply self-control. It's discipline. And it requires effort on our part to discipline ourselves. When my flesh wants to watch a movie, when my flesh wants to participate in something vile and evil, no, we have to be temperate in all things. So I tell myself, no, you're not doing that, Ronald David. The Holy Ghost lives inside of you and you know very well that the Holy Ghost doesn't want to participate in that. And so therefore, no, you're not doing that. So we have to be add to our knowledge. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Add to faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge and knowledge, temperance. And then he says you need to add to temperance, patience. Patience is simply steadfast endurance it's someone who is loyal to their faith in jesus christ regardless of even the greatest trials and sufferings our forefathers peter james and john the, the people in hebrews 11 all of these people that have gone before us our 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 forefathers in, in pentecost the apostolic brethren who have come before us hundreds of years in going back even thousands of years before now those people lived the life expecting God to come through on his word. And so they were patient even through the greatest of trials and sufferings. So I've got to add patience to my life. Then he says, add to your patience, godliness. And this is, this is simply God towardness. There is no way that we can give enough time to these things for godliness God towardness to be something in my life. There is no way that I can put a measurement on the amount of time is required for that to happen in our lives. God towardness is not something that comes natural to human beings. But God, again, he's telling us, I've given you everything you need to be godly. That's, that's what he said, those very words in verse three. He says, I've given you everything that pertains to life and godliness or God towardness. How are you going to make application of these things in your life to bring you into this God towardness? I've given it to you. Now practice it. And then he says, add to godliness, brotherly kindness. Again, this is just simply affection toward all the body of Christ. Brotherly kindness, how we treat our brothers and our sisters in the kingdom of God. And then he said, add to brotherly kindness, charity, which is love. And this is outgoing, an outgoing selfless attitude that leads us to sacrifice for the good of others. And again, charity or love is, a, is something we do. It's not something we simply say. Love is what we give and love is what we show. Now, here's the last three things. Well, actually, it's four verses here. But listen, I'm going to try to read these and close it out with this. Verse eight, four, for this purpose, for this reason, if these things be in you, and if these things are abounding that means a grow, growing it actually it means to super abound or super abundance you can't put a measurement on this he says if these things are in you and they are abounding they make you they make you that you shall neither be barren 
nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Barren nor unfruitful. Let me give you a quick definition of the word barren. The word barren means free from labor at leisure. It means lazy, shunning the labor which one ought to perform. What is he saying? He's telling us that if we are adding these things, verse eight, if these things are in you and abound, they make you that you will never be lazy or shunning the labor which we ought to be performing in the kingdom of God. That, and, we will, and we'll never be unfruitful. We'll always be showing the fruit of righteousness in our lives. Righteousness is a gift from God and it produces things in us that not only God sees, but the world around us will see these fruits in our lives and we'll never be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But look at verse nine. But he that lacketh these things is blind and he cannot see afar off. He cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. This is someone who has simply just said, you know what? It's no big deal. I'm just going to let what God has done in me be enough and just let that be. Forgetting the fact that before they ever came to God, they were a sinner of the worst kind. He says these people have forgotten that they were purged from their sins. They have forgotten what God did in their life and the righteousness that he put inside of them. They've simply just closed their eyes to the knowledge of the truth and just thrown their hands up and said, you know what? He saved me. That's good enough. It would be good enough if you would have died coming out of the water, speaking with other tongues and died in the baptistry at that very moment. It would have been enough. But as I stated before, if we have lived a moment or two since being born again of water and spirit, we have a responsibility to take God at his word and to grow in these areas in our life. We do not have a choice to not grow. Because if we're not growing, then we're backsliding. We are pressing and striving and reaching for that which is above. And if you're not stretching for things above, then, then, then you're going backwards. That's just the nature. If you're, if you're um, climbing a mountain, it's, it's, it's up. It's pressing. If you're going to reach the top, you have to keep pressing your way onward. And so it is in our relationship with Jesus Christ. I cannot stop and close my eyes and just simply be blind to what's going on in my life and be blind to um, the things that God has done for me, forgetting that I've been washed in his blood. Because if we're not growing, the nature of humanity, the nature of flesh is that if it's not being pushed to fast and to pray and to seek God through his word, to fellowship the people of God, the body of Christ, the God in his word, um, my care groups, our gatherings on Sundays. If I'm not doing these things, I am backsliding. It's just the nature of who we are. And let's close it with, in verse 10 and 11. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. You'll never backslide if we are constantly allowing these things to be at work in us, that we're constantly giving ourselves to these things about making our calling and election sure. I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. But if you will do what I'm telling you to do, he says, in this making the calling 
in the election sure. That calling is the call of the gospel. The election is being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I've got to make that sure. It's something I do on a regular basis. And if I will do these things, he says, I will never fall. Verse 11, and or for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we will actively allow the glory of righteousness to do its perfect work inside of us, giving ourselves to what God has given us, then at that appointed day, the gates will swing open wide and we will walk upright, boldly and confidently into the city of heaven, never looking back at the things below. Why? Because I pursued after the things that God had provided. I pursued them with diligence. And as I pursue those things in my life, it makes me a conduit for him to work in me and then through me to the world around me. This is the glory of righteousness. This is the manifestation of God in us, in his righteousness, producing his character, producing his ways, producing his likeness in me. So that when I look into the mirror of the word, I see his reflection in me. Amen. I pray tonight that this word challenges you and encourages you to know that you have everything you need. It's simply a matter of us practicing it on a regular basis. Not just regularly as daily, but yes, daily, but constantly allowing these things at work in us. Allowing the struggles, the trials and the tests of everyday life to teach us more and more about God's character and what he's doing inside of us. The things that he's uncovering, the things he's bringing to the surface and saying, you need to deal with that. You need to get that corrected. Uh, that person, you need to forgive and release them. You need to, to let me have that. Quit holding that grudge against that person. Forgive and release. You need to cast that care upon me, that, that issue that, you're, that your mind is weighing on constantly. He says, you need to cast that. I need that. And we give him our minds. We give him these things out of our minds. Then it frees up resources. And he is able to work talking to us, moving in us, through us, getting down and deep inside of our spirits. If you've ever worked on a computer, sometimes you can get so many applications open on your computer or your phone and it's, it uses up the available resources. It uses up RAM. It uses up your, um, your, your memory or your hard drive is being taxed because of too many things going at once. So you have to start shutting things down on that computer, taking some things, you know, shutting programs down and letting those resources be put back to where you really need them. It's the same way. The mind is how God speaks to us. And if my mind is bogged down with the cares of this life, then God cannot use them because those resources are used up. And God will not work around those things. He says, no, you cast those things, you make room for me, and then I can work in you and through you. So tonight, these are things God is dealing with us, especially here at the Rock Church in Clute, Texas. This is what God is talking to us about. We're getting, we're getting ready for a, a worldwide end time revival and harvest that's going to be unlike anything we've ever seen. And we are going to be participants with it. And so we will participate with God in his kingdom through the righteousness of God that he's put within us. So we're going to let righteousness have its perfect work in us now so that when he is ready to call us into service, that we are ready and willing to act. Amen. So would you pray with me right now and let us receive this word into our spirits. Heavenly Father, again tonight, I thank you for your word. And God, I have spoken 
to these people, Lord, and all of us, including myself, those things that you have given me to say. God, we've taken your word very seriously, and now I pray tonight in Jesus' name that what has been spoken will go deep inside of us. By your help and grace, we receive these words. By your help and grace, O Lord, we receive it as the love of God being manifested to us. This is not shame. This is not condemnation. This is not browbeating. This is you, O Lord, drawing us, pulling at us with conviction, stirring us to repentance in certain areas of our life, bringing us into a closer, more intimate relationship with you. So, Father, I receive this word for myself, and I pray that everyone that hears these words now or in the future will also receive these words and allow them to work deep inside, making application, every one of us making application in our own lives of these things, adding to our faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things are at work in us, Father, we will never backslide. We will never be unfruitful. We'll never be barren. And so we pray these things now in Jesus' name for the glory of God. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So God bless you tonight. It's a, again, it's, a great, it's great to be with you. This is the Rock Church in Clute, Texas. We are located at 540 South Main in Clute. And we want to give God all of the, the glory and the honor for the things he is doing in us, the work of the spirit that he is manifesting and those things that he still wants to do. We're giving ourselves to this by faith in Jesus name. And the, the last thing we read was second Peter chapter one, verses one through 11. Second Peter one, one through 11. That was the last thing we read. Amen. So God bless you. Remember this week, um, uh, your care groups on Wednesday night, those of you who go to the church, those of you who are with uh, the, the other Lake Jackson care group, the one that moved from Richwood to Lake Jackson, um, get with your leaders. And if there's any instructions that you need from your leaders, check with them to find out their instructions for this Wednesday night. But we are having it. It will be the week of Thanksgiving that that changes but not this week. So God bless you all. Be in prayer for, for what God is doing in the Rock Church, the things he is working in our behalf, the things that are going on behind the scenes. There are things that I, I can't discuss at this moment that in regards to um, the building and the property and all of that that's been going on, but um, negotiations are ongoing and we are believing that God's will will be done through all of this. Amen. You all have a great evening. The Lord richly bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.